uh, second session of this uh, 60th uh, birthday conference for uh, IMSC. Um, we are happy to welcome distinguished scientists from all over India uh, on this occasion. And our next speaker is one such, Professor Gautam Bhattacharya, who is a director at uh, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics. And he's going to speak to us about a brief history of the Higgs boson. On behalf of all members of uh, SINP, I would like to wish you a very happy birthday, which is tomorrow, I guess, uh, to the entire fraternity of IMSC, the present member, the past members, the students, postdoc, everybody. Uh, although I didn't spend much time in IMSC except through, you know, passing through during conferences and meeting people, mostly that, and meeting people outside, uh, I'm grateful to many of the IMSC uh, colleagues in more than different uh, ways. Uh, when I started my PhD, within 15 days, I saw an announcement of ACRC school happening in IIT Kanpur. I wrote to the director of that school. Uh, RR, who is sitting on the first row, and I was then 15 days old in research, well, whatever research in 15 days, and he accommodated me, so I'm thankful, because that gave me, gave me a kind of opportunity to meet other uh, future colleagues and, uh, you know, friends forever, I mean, those who met, I met during the, uh, during the SCRC school. Uh, one of as you know, I mean, within fir first 15 days, you, you, you learn uh, almost nothing. So one of the first courses I have ever had in particle physics was given by, by Murthy, uh, who is here, probably here. Yeah, I saw him at least during lunchtime. He didn't, he's around. Uh, well, I, I'll come back to my uh, reminiscences about IMSC uh, uh, as, I, as I proceed. Uh, uh, Last time I gave a talk on this podium was during uh, WEP, which is a high energy particle physics uh, conference series, which was organized by, by Rahul, our friend, who is probably watching from somewhere up there. And I'm thankful to him for g giving me an opportunity to give a review talk in WEP. Okay, so today I will uh, I'll not talk about uh, the nitty gritties of science or particle physics as such, but uh, we'll talk about the historical developments of some of the things that eventually led to the discovery of the, uh, of the Higgs boson. Okay, so uh, I'll take you 100 years ago, approximately, when Maxwell's electromagnetism, Einstein's special relativity, and quantum mechanics were working too well. Quantum electrodynamics, which was created from the union of these three to describe how light interacts with atoms, uh, faced an ugly roadblock. Now, well, I mean, as you all know, I mean, the, well, this slide almost everybody knows uh, that uh, uh, the vacuum, the way we describe vacuum in quantum field theory is not empty, but it is bubbling with uh, temporary particle and antiparticle pair uh, and the interaction of photon with those uh, transient uh, particle antiparticle field distorts the electromagnetic field itself. This happens because quantum mechanics allows for non-conservation of energy for a very short period delta T as long as, well, by an amount delta E. Uh, now, when people calculated the mass of the electron and the charge of the electron, then after summing up all the possibilities, including the intermediate virtual particles in all possible ways, they found the result is infinity. And that is the ugly roadblock I mentioned. In 1947, the year we became independent, 75 years ago, in a Shelter Island conference uh, near New York, uh, Lamb, American physicist, he reported a measurement of a split of one part in a million in the electron energy levels in hydrogen atom which according to Dirac equation uh, should not have been there. Now, using quantum electrodynamics, people tried to calculate it and they again found infinity. 
So, in that conference which was convened by Oppenheimer, uh, he asked uh, two young extremely bright uh, physicists, uh, Schwinger and Feynman uh, to uh, and there were others as well to work it out, I mean to, to, to you know to tame this infinity. Now, Schwinger did it in his own way, Feynman did as usual used his trick and finally the conclusion was the following. You try to calculate the mass and the charge, you find infinity, the expressions look very similar when you try to calculate the splitting in the hydrogen spectrum. Now, you replace that infinity by the measured value of the mass and the charge and so replacing the infinity by the experimentally measured values, you can reproduce, actually they did reproduce the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. The technique of using known values which is which are experimental values to calculate other values eventually became known as renormalization. Meanwhile, uh, development in gauge theory took place. Now, QED is a gauge theory which relies on invariance under a gauge or phase transformation at each point in space time. And the carrier of this uh, electromagnetic force is photon which we will call a gauge boson. Now, gauge invariance means that regardless of the scheme of accountancy that does not matter which way you calculate, you end up getting the same result. Okay? And it is a profound scheme that causes the electromagnetic force to exist and it ensures that photon is strictly massless. Then people try to include more particle instead of one electron they used a pair of particles for example, the neutron and proton I mean just as an x and y for example, more than one fermion and they tried to construct the QED like model, but because now the algebra involved matrices uh, more than one photon like object emerged and some of them are charged electrically charged. At the same time the role of weak interaction was realized uh, in for example, in uh, in beta decay as well as in explaining why we get daylight from from the burning of the solar fuel and that required a massive not massless electrically charged gauge boson. In the 19 uh, I think in 1957 the V minus A nature of weak interaction uh, which was uh, proposed by an ex director of IMSC Sudarshan and his PhD supervisor Marshak uh, and more or less at the same time by Feynman and Gelman there was you know stories I am not going to get into that, but uh, there was realization that electromagnetic and weak interaction may have some con common connection, but the problem was that to explain beta decay or to, exp or to explain radioactivity you needed a massive charge gauge boson, but the mass is incompatible with gauge invariance. How to reconcile gauge invariance with massive gauge boson? If you include the mass by hand the infinities will bounce back. So, the message from the previous slide will go. So, we have to realize these two things I mean to reconcile gauge invariance at the same time we have to have a massive gauge boson. is apparently disconnected idea, but we will see how they are connected is the concept of hidden symmetry. Now, you all know about this Salam's banquet that if you sit in a round table, although there is a symmetry I mean if you sit here you can choose one from the left, one from the right. The moment you make up your mind and choose from the right, everyone else will have to choose from the from the right. Okay? So, the symmetry is broken. Similarly, if you go sub 0 to sub 0 temperature the rotational full rotational symmetry of water molecules is reduced to discrete symmetries in this case the six fold discrete symmetry um, in the form of the snowflakes, which this is the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking which which says that somehow transition from a phase with full symmetry uh, takes place to a phase with lesser symmetry. Similar things happen in the context of superconductivity, where the symmetry that is hidden is the gauge invariance of electromagnetism 
and which leads to organized Cooper pair bonding. Uh, well, I mean, th there are similarities and dissimilarities uh, to the context I'm going to get to. Essentially, in superconductivity, I mean, BCS tried to explain the dynamical feature of it that uh, the two electrons seem to attract each other near the Fermi surface. But what is important in our con context is symmetry breaking and the unbroken subgroup. Okay. So, the unbroken subgroup in this case is a rotation by, well, uh, by 180 degree, which says that you have to replace E by minus E, and which means an, an even number of pairing of uh, electrons can get an expectation value, which gives rise to Cooper pair bonding. So, essentially, with the help of uh, the symmetry breaking and what is your unbroken subgroup, one can uh, justify the zero electrical resistance and uh, exact flux quantization. But uh, BCS tried to explain uh, the approximate dynamical symmetry breaking uh, in a different context. So, in our context, the symmetry group and the unbroken subgroup is important. Okay. So, Nambu realized um, in the early 60s as well as, sorry, where, yeah, uh, Goldstone that uh, and in fact, Goldstone gave a uh, rigorous mathematical proof that wherever, uh, uh, whenever there is a spontaneous breaking of a uh, continuous, not discrete, continuous global symmetry, uh, massless bosons would appear and they are called the number Goldstone bosons. This Mexican hat potential we have seen uh, in the textbooks. It says that the Goldstone bosons, uh, which are massless, con co you know, correspond to the degree of freedom along this zero, uh, well, I mean, this minimum, the orbit of minimum energy configuration, if you try to stretch the orbit, you need energy, and that is a massive mode. So, uh, uh, so the question is, where are those massless modes? You, experimentally, there was no evidence. So, there are two problems. Uh, one is the problem of having massive gauge boson to explain radioactivity. How do you reconcile mass with gauge invariance? and so, so that the infinities don't hit back. And the second is, where are these massless bosons if you try to connect these two ideas? So, whether it's a problem or an opportunity. So, these two problems together can lead to an earth shaking solution. Well, this is the only mathematical equation I have in my slides. So, essentially the, the, the Goldstone modes or the number Goldstone modes correspond to uh, these ones, the which which are in the which correspond, for example, in this Mexican hat potential case, uh, this mode corresponds to the one in the exponential. Whereas, if you try to stretch it, uh, the mode that corresponds to stretching of the orbit is the sigma, uh, which will be massive, and v is the order parameter. Okay. Now, there are two issues then. One is the generation of the gauge boson mass, okay, and another thing is what happens to that sigma, namely the uh, massive uh, spin zero particle. Now, on this slide, I will probably spend a little bit of time that Anderson, uh, he said that in a superconductor, electromagnetic field is short ranged. I mean, photon is massive. It simply means that uh, the following that uh, how to give an example. Suppose we are driving through a tunnel, then because of the metal on the tunnel, we see that our radio signal is not weak, is, is not uh, good, I mean is weak, which means that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, electrical field has a problem, has a distortion coming through the metal, but the compass still points to the north, means there is no problem with the magnetic field. Inside a superconductor, both electric and magnetic fields are repelled. Okay, the repelling of the magnetic is Meissner effect. So, which means the electromagnetic field leaves on the skin of the superconducting surface. And because it is short ranged, the corresponding uh, carrier appears massive. So, photon is massive, okay, inside a superconductor. Now, Anderson thought of a plasma in which that the photon becomes massive inside a superconductor in the following way, that the zero mass of the photon in quantum electrodynamics 
and the massless goldstone boson arising from spontaneous symmetry breaking, they marry each other. So, one degree of freedom is lost due to uh, the fact that the goldstone bosons are not seen by us, which reappeared in the form of the massive uh, degree of, well, massive mode, I mean, the third degree of freedom for the quant for the photon. Now, the embarrassing massless boson, the goldstone boson is avoided in a non-relativistic plasma. So, that was Anderson's idea. Now, Klein and Ben Lee, so they said that the goldstone theorem, goldstone theorem tells you that the massless mode has to be there, okay, if there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. The embarrassing thing is that it is not experimentally seen or uh, you know, it will have catastrophic consequence. It is not there. So, where it, has it gone? So, Goldstone theorem fails in non-relativistic theories. That is what Klein and Lee said, okay. Anderson's superconductivity is a non-relativistic phenomenon. But they also said that this argument holds in relativistic theories as well. That is not correct. Gilbert, now I'll, I'll, I'll talk about him. He was a... Uh, uh, I think he was a post, uh, he was a po he was a PhD student of uh, not Salah, in Imperial College of Matthews. Matthews has a Chennai connection. He was born in Chennai. And he gave a no-go theorem. He said that the presence of Goldstone boson cannot be avoided in relativistic theories. Okay, so it's a no-go theorem. So that means it's, it's really a roadblock. Okay. Now, I will talk about Gilbert a little later. Now, American Braut and uh, Anglia, Francois Anglia is, is, is Belgian. So, Braut got a remarkable postdoc in, 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 in Anglia and they elevated Anderson's assertion from consmatter perspective. They approached the thing mostly from consmatter point of view. They said that in relativistic field theory, uh, they required a massive scalar boson, they did not emphasize on it, but they mention about the mass generation mechanism exactly the way, roughly the way, I would not say exactly the way, roughly the way uh, that I described before that photon is uh, massless to start with, it eats up the goldstone boson and become massive, okay, and the massless goldstone boson disappears. That was Braut and Anglia and they wrote their paper in uh, in summer months of 1966. I mean, these months are important. A few months later, Guralnik, Hagen and Tom Kibble, they wrote a similar paper that Goldstone boson need not be present in locally conserved theories. Uh, locally conserved theories means gauge theories. And the force carrier is like photon-like object, like for example, which would eventually be known as W is a charged gauge boson in, in beta decay, they become massive. I was telling you how they become massive because uh, radioactivity requires massive gauge boson uh, to uh, mediate weak interaction. They become massive by eating up those goldstone bosons. So, they concentrated only on mass generation of the gauge bosons and they did not mention about the massive scalar. You remember this, uh, sorry. Uh, where I have to go. Uh, uh, they did not, they did not mention about this particular scalar. They were talking about this particular Goldstone bosons. So, so uh, they concentrated on the mass generation mechanisms as were Braut and Engl Engler, okay. Peter Higgs came within a few months in the picture. So, he said, so, what he did? He avoided the no-go theorem. He obliterated the no-go theorem of, of Gilbert. Gilbert said you cannot avoid having a Goldstone boson and that is the embarrassing situation because nature does not have it. Hick said, yes, of course, uh, Goldstone boson would be there, but not in uh, a relativistic theory which contains gauge fields. So, Gilbert's argument fails. So, this impasse was lifted and massless scalar boson avoided. So, you see that up to this point, uh, all these three sets of people, Braut and Anglia, Guralnik, Hagen and Kibble, Higgs, 
they're all similar. They are, they are trying to explain the mass generation of the gauge boson, the mechanism of mass generation of the gauge boson and uh, that, uh, you know, the Goldstone bosons are devoured, they're eaten up by gauge bosons, which in turn massive. But due to some divine intervention, when you, you know, get a referee, when your paper gets refused in the first place, and you have a referee who is very helpful, uh, Hicks got a referee, uh, you know, who suggested that what about that massive mode, which you have not talked about. Now, in those days, uh, people were, uh, you know, very Brahminic in nature, even outside India. They did not want to talk about a spin zero particle, a hypothetical particle, which has not been seen and nowhere to be seen whose mass is not predicted by the theory. So, it's not that nobody noticed it, but they all focused on the mass generation mechanism. The, they did not want to talk about that particular sigma, okay. So, Higgs was forced to talk about that sigma, okay, that is the radial excitation, which is a massive excitation and that is the Higgs boson, which ultimately would give him the Nobel Prize. Again, due to that divine intervention I am talking about, okay. Now, I, I, I promise that I will tell you a story. So, Gilbert uh, started his career as a, what would you call, what do you, you would say, particle physicist in the in today's language. But by the time he did his PhD, he was kind of fed up having proposed a no-go theorem. So, he was a, he got a good recommendations from Salam. He went to, uh, he went to uh, Harvard and he met Watson on Creek on the same corridor where he got an office. He was impressed by their work. He started working on human genome and 1980 got Nobel Prize in human genome. On the other hand, Higgs, his, he did his PhD in molecular physics. Well, he got interested in the no-go theorem. He tried to bypass that no-go theorem, succeeded and got a Nobel Prize in, in particle physics. So, their path crisscrossed. In the year 1962, the year this institute was founded, Glasso created a model with massive gauge bosons together with a massless QED which is photon. It is not technically renormalizable as he put the mass by hand, uh, well, I mean, but uh, he only hinted that unification of weak and electromagnetic forces might contain the clue for renormalizability. On the other hand, Salam and John Ward, they independently constructed the SU2 cross U1 theory, but as world experts of renormalization, they, they understood the, you know, the gauge theory part far too well, but they were unable to digest the masses of the WZ bosons because that would ruin the renormalizability. Kibble is the person who incorporated, you know, he was very good in mathematics and group theory. So, he incorporated group theory into the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So, the marrying of spontaneous symmetry breaking with the theory of Young-Mills theory, the gauge theory, together yielded the eventually the right result that the two degrees of uh, freedom of photon, namely the two transverse degrees of freedom plus the two complex degrees of freedom of a, uh, of a complex scalar field were reorganized as three degrees of freedom for the photon, namely the two transverse and one longitudinal for the mass and one remnant, the sigma degree of freedom, in the massive scalar mode. So, together it is 2 plus 2 is 3 plus 1. So, it is very loose way of saying, but Keeble incorporated group theory into the whole idea. Finally, it's Weinberg. Uh, Weinberg's name was mentioned in a talk uh, by Rohini. Uh, uh, Weinberg used the SSB idea, this spontaneous symmetry breaking idea in SU2 cross U1 model. Salam independently promoted this model, realizing the significance of the mass generation mechanism maintaining gauge invariance. And then came Etoft. I mean, you can see Etoft's picture outside this uh, uh, auditorium. Yes, I mean, he might have come here. I'm sure he, uh, I have seen him once in, in, in IMSC. He might have come here many times. So, Etoft is, is different. Etoft's the way of thinking is different. Just like Messi plays differently. I mean, it's not that he's a much better player than the others. So, Etoft thinks differently. He went to Karze summer school. And there, Ben Lee was talking about 
uh, the um, unitarization of the sigma pi model that the pions which are the Goldstone bosons, if you look at the pion pion scattering to pion pion, you need an intermediate sigma which is the old pi sigma model. So, it appeared to adopt that maybe you need that sigma pi, well I mean the sigma in denoted is not the pi sigma sigma. So, so he, he, you need the a scalar degree of freedom spin 0 massive degree of freedom to unitarize the WW scattering to WW. That is the bad high energy uh, behavior can be tamed if you require, if you incorporate a, 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 a massive spin 0 degree of freedom into your theory. So, that will unitarize, that will give a lot of uh, uh, credibility to the standard model. So, uh, from the bad, high, the bad high energy behavior can be, can be tamed by incorporating the Higgs field. Uh, finally, in 2012, uh, when uh, the CMS spokesperson uh, Joe Incandela and the Alice spokesperson Fabiola Genotti showed us this, those plots, our heart stopped, right? I mean, this bump. We have, we have been waiting for long and eventually the Higgs boson was discovered 10 years ago. The important thing is that the, uh, interact, the, the strength of the Higgs coupling to the pair of gauge bosons, namely ZZ or WW, that was experimentally found to be, uh, you know, I mean, related to the Z mass. I mean, this proves the mass generation mechanism. And this mechanism was promoted by Anderson, Brau, Tonglea, Guralnik, Hagen, Higgs, Kibble, et al. But only Higgs talked about the Higgs boson. So there was no dispute about that. The sigma particle was talked only by the Higgs, again by the referee's intervention I talked. The disintegration of this particle into means the so called Higgs boson into two photons and study of studying of angular momentum uh, of the various decay products showed that it has spin zero. Okay. Uh, importantly, Yukawa force, if not anything, Yukawa force was measured at LHC and unlike the strong, uh, weak and electromagnetic force, Yukawa force is not quantized. You can see uh, Higgs and Onglea, Braut uh, passed away and Guralnik, Hagen and Kibble were three months late and it's a rule of three. So, uh, there was no other choice, okay, to share this prize and Rolf Hoyer is uh, seen with, with the two Nobel laureates, eventual Nobel laureates. That day they didn't get the Nobel Prize. But it was sealed, the writing was on the wall. Final outlook. The standard model of uh, Glasow, that was 1962 paper, uh, Weinberg, 1967, and uh, Salam, his uh, set of lectures in Imperial College, uh, is now a standard theory. It shouldn't be called a model anymore. The mass of the Higgs boson is approximately, well, I shouldn't say approximately, it is now so precise that was not thought when LHC was built to find out the Higgs boson. LHC was a win-win machine. SSC was scrapped, so the Americans couldn't do it. So, LHC was a win-win machine because either you see Higgs or in the absence of Higgs, you will see the strong scattering of the W. WW scattering, you will see with very high luminosity, you will be able to see that. Okay, that is what Etop said that there will be bad high energy growth, so you will see strong scattering. So, but with a precision of 1 GeV, nobody attested that. Nobody could imagine that LHC would reach that kind of precision even 10 years ago, okay. Even after the discovery of the Higgs. Today, the precision is even less, okay. Now, uh, the problem is that, uh, that uh, uh, I think Rohini mentioned, why is uh, LHC, uh, Higgs so, so light? I mean 100 GeV, it, the theory is renormalizable no doubt, but the theory is not robust. Standard model or standard theory is not robust. If I add a particle which interacts with the known particles with the gauge bosons or with the Higgs uh, at a very high scale, I mean close to, you know, I mean say 10, 15 orders of magnitude heavier than the Higgs boson, then that mass would appear as through the virtual corrections 
contributing to the Higgs mass. Now, that is the most uncomfortable situation. Now, some people would say, why do you care? There is no such particle. The question is, theory is not robust against the presence of these hypothetical particles. If you look at the evolution of physics, molecular physics does not care about atomic physics. Atomic physics does not care about the mass of the nu nu nucleon. And the mass of proton does not care about your top mass. Okay? So, there are symmetries protecting each layers. So, in this case, we are looking for fundamental symmetries which would protect the Higgs mass against such bad quantum corrections. And this is one of the, you know, motivations for going, you know, beyond the standard model, at least to find the stability of the, of the, of the Higgs boson. As uh, Dr. Ramoswamy mentioned, he is not here, that for a country like India, stability is very important. For a model like standard model, which you are trying to claim as a standard theory, stability is very important. So, even if there is another source of the dark matter from somewhere, some people claim that, uh, you know, it may ha have a non-particle physics source. Uh, let me not get into that. Even the model itself from the theoretical point of view is not quite stable. If you get dark matter from a beyond standard model physics and that physics can explain the stability of the Higgs plus some other, you know, minor hiccups here and there, we would be very happy. So, there are two ways to go or three ways to go or four ways to go. Some are more popular, some are less popular. Supersymmetry has been a popular way of going phys for physics beyond the standard model. Additional dimensions, uh, like additional space-like curl dimension is another way of, you know, going towards, uh, you know, BSM and constructing BSM. Supersymmetry is also extra dimension. I mean, it is an extra dimension in fermionic coordinates. So, so that way, these kinds of space-time extensions uh, or, you know, in fermionic modes or in the normal, uh, you know, space-like modes, but curl, uh, give us something. But we have to yet, you know, see the evidence of, of, of those things, okay. So, the other question is whether Higgs is an elementary particle or a composite particle. And there are plenty of other questions, okay. So, let us not get into that. My job here was to, you know, I mean, uh, highlight the uh, the historical developments that led us here. And uh, one thing somebody said that we missed many opportunities. So, there is one opportunity where, you know, like when, you know, whole world went to gauge theory, uh, we were slow. We, we did not quite get into that as fast as we should have. One of the earliest lectures came from uh, one of our colleagues from IMSC, Rajaji, Rajasekharan Gate gave a set of lectures on gauge theory application in uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the muon in Saha Institute in the early 70s. It was, I think, you know, RR would recall, I, I don't know, in the, there was a SINP note by Rajaji on, uh, on, on, on gauge theory calculation uh, in, in, in the early days. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we could have contributed more had we been into that game uh, more intensely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to, to give you a small memento. <laughs>